Sewing Vocabulary State Standard HS4.T.CR3.C Reimagine and revise technical design choices and apply a high level of technical proficiencies during the course of a rehearsal process to enhance the story and emotional impact of a devised or scripted theatrical work. This unit is all about developing some basic sewing skills. As the state standard implies, you are expected to be able to use technical proficiencies at a high level. Before we can get to a high level of technical proficiency, we have to accomplish goals at a basic level of technical proficiency. Before we can do any of that, we have to learn the appropriate terminology for the skills that we are trying to employ. Hence, a vocabulary lesson. I could dress this up in a number of ways, but the fact of the matter is, if you are going to do any sewing at all, you have to understand these terms. So we're gonna dive right in and begin by talking about materials that are necessary for sewing. First, you're going to need fabric. Every garment on the planet consists of fabric. This is cloth that is produced by weaving textile fibers. Sometimes those fibers are natural like cotton or linen or wool. And sometimes those fibers are synthetic like rayon, acrylic, or polyester. Regardless, those fibers are woven together to create sheets of fabric, which are then sold on a bolt. A bolt is a roll of cloth that is of a standard width. So when you buy fabric off of a bolt, it is either gonna be 45 inches wide or 60 inches wide, although there is some variation to that, but those are your two most common bolt measurements. And then you order your fabric or you purchase your fabric in store by the yard. So a yard is three feet of fabric when it is cut off of a bolt, retaining the width of that bolt. So a single yard of fabric will be 36 inches by either 45 or 60 inches, depending on the bolt that you purchase it from. These standards of measurements allow garment makers, costume designers, and sewists of all varieties to know exactly how much fabric they need to purchase because they will be able to determine how many square inches of fabric they will be purchasing compared to how many square inches of fabric they need in order to complete a project. Once we get fabric home, as we go to construct a garment or any sort of fabric art, there are some things that we have to consider. Namely, the second that we begin to cut into fabric, including the moment it is cut off of the bolt at the store, it is likely to fray. Fray is a word that refers to when fabric begins to unravel or become worn at the edge. Sometimes you want this on purpose. If you've ever bought a pair of jeans that had a hole in them, you intentionally purchased fabric that had frayed at the edges. The weave had become loose and undone. But most of the time, discounting pairs of jeans that are made that way we don't want our garments to fray at the edges because once they begin to fray, they run the risk of becoming structurally unsound. If, for example, your jeans were not fraying at the knees, but rather at the seam that runs along your backside, then it runs the risk of ripping open when you go to sit down. A seam is a line where two pieces of cloth or other material are sewn together. That is the correct terminology and the terminology I will be expecting you to use for when you sew two pieces of fabric together or where one piece of fabric is sewn to meet its opposite edge or a different edge of that fabric. That is called a seam where two pieces of fabric or other material are sewn together. But to prevent fraying at the edges, then we need to hem the fabric. This is both a verb and a noun. A hem refers to when you fold the fabric back on itself and sew it down to prevent fraying. The only reason we hem a garment is to prevent the fabric from fraying at the edges. 
So in noun form, this refers to a place where fabric has been folded back and sewn down. In verb form, this, this refers to the action of doing it, of folding fabric back on itself and then sewing it in place to prevent fraying. Hems prevent fraying. Now we're going to talk about preparing fabric. All good sewing begins with good pressing. All good sewing, just like any other art form, begins by preparing your materials for their appropriate use. A painter sometimes has to mix pigments and colors together and clean their brushes before they are able to create a work of art. A sculptor must prepare the clay on the um, potter's wheel or uh, uh, make sure that their tools are correctly shaped and sharpened. Fabric artists do the same thing, and one of the first things that a fabric artist is going to do after washing fabric is to press that fabric. So you, to do this, you are going to use an iron. An iron is a small handheld appliance with a handle that is holding a flat, that is roughly triangular surface that when heated can press fabric smooth and remove any creases that are unnecessary or unwanted. An iron can also be used to reshape fabric. When you get into more advanced sewing, um, you will not press fabric on a flat surface. Rather, you will press it on a rounded surface before you work with it, especially if you are doing things like attaching shoulders onto top garments that need arms attached to them or sleeves attached to them. Uh, for our purposes, though, we're only going to be working with materials on flat surfaces or that need to be pressed smooth before we begin. By the way, the correct term for using an iron to smooth the wrinkles out of a garment is pressing. We press a garment. Now, I know the term iron or ironing gets used all of the time. And in fact, the surface on which we press a garment is called an ironing board. However, the correct term in sewing communities for smoothing a garment using heat and pressure is called pressing because it's not just waving the iron back and forth over the garment. You actually do need to apply pressure as well as the correct heat setting for your fabric. We also use marks to indicate where a piece of fabric is going to either be sewn or cut. A lot of sewists, uh, sewers, seamstresses, whatever you want to uh, call it, any of those terms are acceptable. A lot of sewists use chalk to mark their fabric. I don't personally like using chalk because it's very good at its intended purpose. A chalk mark is supposed to very easily disappear so that it doesn't leave any residue on your fabric. Unfortunately, that means while you're working with fabric that has been marked with chalk, you're likely to lose your place. You're likely to accidentally rub off your marks. I prefer to use a water-soluble fabric marker that is in a different color than my fabric. Provided I am working with a fabric that can be washed, that can have water applied to it, a water-soluble marker is my personal preference because that mark will disappear once I throw the garment back into the wash or once I launder that garment, but those marks will not disappear while I'm working with it. So a water-soluble marker is going to be your best friend for making marks on your garments. Chalk is acceptable, but I only recommend chalk as a tool for very advanced sewers. While we are marking garments, oftentimes we will use the tool that you are seeing on the screen now. This is a special kind of ruler called a seam gauge. And a regular ruler can actually be used in place of a seam gauge, um, but I prefer to have a seam gauge. But I prefer to have a seam gauge with me, number one, because they're pretty cheap and light. Number two, because they come with this sliding marker built into them so that I can set my seam allowance, which is how much area I want between the edge of the fabric and my stitching line. I can set that measurement, tape that marker down, and not have to refine my measurement mark. So for example, if I want a one inch seam allowance, I set my marker to one inch, 
tape that in place and then I don't even have to look at the tick marks on my ruler until I'm ready to set it to a different measurement. The seam gauge allows you to make those measurements very quickly and it, it speeds along the process of measuring your seam allowance. So some definitions, your seam gauge is a ruler with a sliding marker that is used to quickly and accurately measure seam allowance. A seam allowance is the area between the edge of the fabric and the stitching line, which prevents seams from falling out due to frayed fabric. So we include a seam allowance so that when fabric does eventually fray, because all fabric will eventually fray, that it does not immediately destroy the seams. Fabric can begin to fray inside a hem, for example, or inside a folded seam without destroying the garment when we give it some seam allowance, when we give it some room to do its fraying. Now we need to talk about our cutting tools. The first item you are seeing on the screen is a weird little device called a seam ripper. Its only function is to unpick stitches that have been put in incorrectly or to unpick stitches when I'm resizing a garment. So for example, if I sew in a line of stitches and it turns out those were in the wrong place, I would use a seam ripper to pick those back out. Or if I am going to take a garment apart and use it to create a pattern for a new garment, I would use my seam ripper to only unpick the stitches without cutting the fabric itself. Or if I have sewn something and it's a little bit too small, but I've got enough seam allowance that I can resize it, I will use a seam ripper to unpick the stitches and then re-sew that line so that the garment fits correctly. The next item we are gonna talk about is a pair of fabric shears. I know what you're gonna say. Miss Street, those are scissors. They, they look like a, a regular pair of scissors. What is, what is the difference between scissors and fabric shears? I'm so glad you asked, imaginary student. You ask such wonderful questions. The difference between fabric shears and scissors is twofold. First, a pair of fabric shears is angled so that you can keep one of the blades almost flush, which means touching the work surface that you are cutting your fabric on. So that way it, you are um, going to be much more likely to get a straight and accurate cut. The second difference, however, is that fabric shears are specifically designed to cut fabric. They are ridiculously sharp but they can be dulled by paper products pretty darn easily. So fabric shears are angled and designed specifically to cut fabric, whereas scissors are designed to cut whatever they happen to come in contact with. Yes, scissors are designed to cut fabric, but they are also designed to cut paper or thin plastic or whatever other material they come into contact with. So fabric shears should only ever be used on fabric. If you use your fabric shears to cut out paper, you are going to destroy them or at least dull them to the point you're gonna have to take them to a grinder and have them resharpened. If you are ever in the classroom working on a sewing-based project and you see me start to lose my mind and scream at somebody, it's probably because they're using my good fabric shears to try to cut paper. I keep my fabric shears in my desk. They are not available for just any old student to grab, as opposed to my regular scissors, which I keep in a paint bucket. Um, so if you've ever seen me fuss at somebody before I let them use my black-handled, angled scissors, those are not scissors. Those are fabric shears, and I'm very protective of them. There is a special kind of fabric shear called a pinking shear. This is the kind of uh, shear that is going to cut a zigzagged line into the fabric. If you look close at the bottom picture on the PowerPoint, you'll see that it cuts a jagged edge as opposed to a straight edge. And we use pinking shears for fabrics with a really loose weave that are very likely to fray before we can get them hemmed or seamed into whatever garment we're making out of them. So we would use this for something like gossamer or chiffon or sometimes tulle. Depending on how soft the fibers of tulle are, it can fray and fall apart on you pretty easily. 
So we would use pinking shears for those types of fabrics to keep them from fraying at least until we can get them hemmed and seamed into a garment. Once we have our materials cut out, once we have them pressed and ready to go, then we need to start building our garment. So we're going to need some special tools for that. I really hope I don't have to define needle for you. But what I do need to let you know is that there are a wide variety of needles and it does make a difference. There are certain kinds of needles that you don't want to use on your standard garment making project because they're too big for the job. They're going to leave large holes. They're going to tear the fabric as opposed to sew through the fabric. So you want to make sure if you are going to use needles for hand sewing projects like repairing hems or fixing holes or other things that you are likely to need these kinds of sewing skills to do, that you are using sharps. Don't use embroidery needles or any other kind of needle that you might run into. Certainly don't use a yarn needle. Sharps are pretty small. Usually they're not much longer than about an inch and a half, definitely no longer than two inches. The eye of a sharp is very tiny. It is pretty easy to lose them. So a lot of times you'll see people who so regularly keep a piece of thread in their sharps and keep their sharps in a pin cushion just to keep up with them because they're so small that they're pretty easy to lose. But we use regular sharps for your standard sewing projects. They are small enough to be easy to use for a hand sewing project and they're not going to tear up the material while you're working with it. The eye of the needle also makes a huge difference. Depending on the kinds of fibers that you're working with, a sharp may not cut it. So embroidery thread, for example, will not fit through the eye of a sharp. The eye is the small opening in a needle in which thread is going to be inserted. Standard thread will fit through a regular sharp just fine. And that is the kind of needle that you need to be working with for projects in my class. However, because the eye of a sharp is pretty tiny, often you'll need a little assistance getting it threaded. And so that's where a little aluminum foil threader like you see pictured here comes in pretty handy. If you buy one of those um, little mini sewing kits that usually come with a couple of different colors of thread and a small foil with some needles in it, usually they will also come with one of these little, it looks like a dime with some aluminum foil wrapped around it. Um, and it's got a little tiny wire sticking out the bottom of it. The way you use it is you stick that little metal bit through the eye of the needle and it creates a much larger eye for you to work with, so that way you can thread the needle a lot more easily. And once you run your thread through that little wire, you pull it back through the eye of the needle, and then you're ready to go. I have been known to make fun of people who use thimbles regularly because I was always sort of misunderstanding the point of a thimble. A thimble is there to protect your fingers from getting stuck. I was never really appropriately taught how to use one, mostly because I have learned most of my sewing skills on a machine. I very rarely do much hand sewing unless I'm, I'm absolutely forced to. There are certain kinds of hemming, for example. Um, for example, gentlemen, when you go to get your dress pants hemmed, um, if you go to the, you know buy a tuxedo or a suit and you have those pants specifically hemmed to fit you, um, those have to be done by hand because of the kind of stitch that is used to make the hem invisible. And for that kind of work, actually using a thimble to push your needle along does make the work go a lot faster if you know how to use them and if you are wearing the correct size of thimble. However, if you are only using it because you are afraid of getting stuck by a needle, you need to build a bridge and get over it. It does not hurt that bad. Because I am not going to be able to teach you how to use one accurately, I'm not expecting you to use one at all especially because in order to use a thimble accurately, you have to purchase the right size of thimble. They go on the middle finger of your dominant hands, the one that you are going to put the needle in when you are working. If your thimble is falling off your finger, it is too big and you might as well not even use one because it's, not gonna, it's just going to get in your way. And usually that's why I've never really used them because I've never had one that was the right size. So I usually just tough it out and deal with my fingers being a little bit sore after sewing. <laughs> 
You're also going to need some thread. Thread is the binding agent. So if the needle is the tool that is used to help fabric attach to each other, the thread is the binding agent. Um, think of it like a hammer and nails. A hammer is the, the tool that is going to put everything together, but the nails are what actually hold pieces of wood together. Same deal. Your thread is what actually fastens fabric together. It is a long, thin strand of fiber. Sometimes that's cotton fiber. Sometimes it's nylon. A lot of times the really cheap stuff that you get at Walmart that's like $2 a spool, that's polyester fiber. For our purposes, completely fine. But if you get into more advanced sewing, you're going to want to make sure that your thread fiber matches the fiber of the garment that you're sewing. So if you're making a cotton, say it's going to be a shirt, you're going to make a cotton shirt, you're going to want to use cotton thread. Just trust me on that one. You want to make sure your thread matches the fiber of your material. For our purposes, it does not matter. So now we've got all of our materials and we are ready to start sewing. So here's your official definition. To sew means to join fabric by making stitches with a needle and a thread. A single stitch is one pass of a needle in whatever stitch style. It is one pass of the needle through the fabric. You need to make sure that your thread is knotted when you begin. This means to tie a loop in the end of the thread to make sure that it does not pull out and undo all of your work before you are finished with it. That's how you begin. You tie a knot in the end of your thread to prevent it from being pulled through the fabric as you're working. Once you are done, then there is a special type of knot used to secure the very, very last stitch in your row of stitches. This is called a lock stitch. I will expect you to know how both to knot your thread and how to lock stitch your thread, and I will teach you how to do both of these things. We are gonna learn three kinds of stitch. First, I'm going to teach you how to baste. This is also known as tacking. I've heard both terms used interchangeably. I use both terms interchangeably. A baste or a tack is a very, very weak and very loose stitching techniques that oftentimes you're going to use this um, for a temporary project. So a lot of times you will see seamstresses or, or sewers use a baste or a tack stitch in place of pins. I will do this for a machine sew project. Instead of pinning my fabric together to run it through a machine, which runs the risk of tearing up my needles in my machine, I will baste something, which works exactly as well as pins, but does not run the risk of tearing up my machine. It also does not ever run the risk of pins falling out. A baste or a tack stitch will not fall out until you take it out. Unlike pins, which depending on how much you're manipulating the garment before you put in your final stitching line, your pins can fall out and end up poking up out of your carpet that you then step on barefoot. And trust me when I say that is no fun at all. So uh, a basting stitch, knowing how to do this, means that you never have to buy pins if you don't want to buy pins. Notice I did not ask you to buy pins for your sewing kit because I'm going to teach you how to baste and or tack. A running stitch is very much like a baste or a tack stitch, but the stitches are much, much smaller. They're usually no bigger than about a quarter of an inch. I have seen people who are really good at sewing. I've seen people do them down to even a, a couple of millimeters, very, very tiny stitches. We are gonna use a running stitch primarily to finish off seams if we're sewing by hand. Although, depending on uh, where in the garment I'm putting this line of stitches, I might also use a running stitch for a hem as well. But I'm never going to use a running stitch for a seam, especially a seam that has to take a lot of stress. For example, the seam where I'm going to attach a sleeve to the body of a shirt, because that is going to take a lot of stress. It's going to need to be, it's going to be pulled out a lot. So I need something a lot stronger. So for those areas of seaming where I need to have a really, really strong stitch, I'm going to use something called a back stitch. This is just about the strongest stitch that you're going to be able to do by hand without the aid of a sewing machine. So these are the three that I'm going to teach you. A baste or a tack, a running stitch, and a back stitch. <laughs> 
All of these vocabulary words are up for grabs on your vocabulary test. Please make sure to study all of them. I will also expect you to be using this language appropriately as we move through a sewing project.